Hello and welcome back to Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Hey guys, today my friend Jacob Fluharty is back to help me talk about one of our deeper subjects yet again, because someday we'll get together to discuss like, you know, am I the asshole type of threads on Reddit or something. But for the most part, I hit Jacob up to talk to me about these very weighty things that actually involve him doing research. And he's an amazing and good sport about it. Before I get started, what our topic is today is what conditions enhance psychic ability. And please remember, this is not part of a scientific study. This is observational. But we both did do research on the conditions that I have personally seen and other readers that I have seen in predicting reliably like accurate um, intuition and psychic skills. So one of them is forms of neurodivergence, which was very intriguing to me. And one of the things that causes another form of neurodivergence. Now, neurodivergence simply means that your brain works in a different manner and you process information in a different manner than neurotypical people. Neurotypical people com comprise about 80% of the population, maybe as much as 95. This is a developing field. So 5% to 20% of the population is in fact neurodivergent. Some forms of neurodivergence cannot be resolved. So if you're on the autism spectrum scale, you can learn how to cope with it through different techniques, different therapies, sometimes medications. Um, some people, uh, bipolar disorder, I think is one of the forms that can be considered by um, neurodivergent as well. Complex post-traumatic stress disorder can be as well. And we're gonna be talking about what neurodivergence is, how it manifests, how it can be coped with. And we're also then we're going to talk about why it has an impact on psychic abilities, on your ability to intuit, and your ability to connect to your divine self and hopefully find your life's path and be able to be in alignment with all aspects of yourself. So it's kind of like how is neurodivergence sometimes a gift is what we're really talking about. It's just a really roundabout way of getting there. Before I get started, if you want to book me for a private reading or a life coaching session, you do that at attherisingmoon.com. And that is the only way to book me. I will literally never send you a message or approach you in a comment section asking, saying that I feel drawn to you, but I charge for readings. That Those are always scam artists. So please remember that. It's not just for me. It's for every tarot reader. You can find me on my YouTube channel, Chromecast at The Rising Moon. I have a Patreon and a membership coming up with a whole bunch of things, including daily energy reads. And then eventually I'll be doing some teaching and some guided meditations. Then we're going to be talking about different forms of magic in that as well. My friend Jacob Fluhardy, the intrepid Jacob Fluhardy, who is actually, mm. <laughs> actually a case study for what we're talking about today. Jacob has um, attention deficit disorder and there is a nationwide Adderall shortage at this particular time. And so Jacob is kind of going through it because he has not been able to have Adderall recently. And so he is literally helping me with this topic while experiencing some of the ways in which neurodivergent people, because uh, attention deficit disorder is a form of neurodivergence, um, what, what you have to cope with. We're literally like watching him cope as we go. And thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today, Jacob? Besides the the brain fog, uh, everything is fantastic. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> hey, can you tell me a little bit about what it's like to have attention deficit disorder? As you know, because you've 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 been diagnosed for a while, and you do take meds for it, and you have it in addition to bipolar disorder. So it's two forms of neurodivergence yeah. right there. <laughs> I know the double whammy. I love it. Um, so uh, I didn't realize I got diagnosed when I was like twenty four ish. I think. Um, basically in my adult life, it's just inability to like maintain, um, maintain certain structures. Um, I flit around from, you know, task to task. So like I can create a to-do list per se, uh, mm -hmm. but in, for example, and I can have like five items on that list. And instead of working through the items, one, two, three, four, five, I'll, uh, go do one thing, like say I'm cleaning my apartment. Apartment. I'll uh, be in my living room and I'll get a bunch of trash and I'll take it to the kitchen and I'll throw it away and then I'll see something in the kitchen that needs to be done. So then I go do that and I'm like, oh crap, I was doing this other thing. So I go back to that and then on the way back to the living room, I'll see something that needs to be done in the, you know, 30 feet from room to room. And it's just, it's for me, it's an inability to re remain focused on any single task. Um, I have trouble like remembering um, details throughout my day if I'm not medicated correctly. Um, 
if I don't write everything, uh, Siri on my phone is a godsend for me because I just tell Siri everything. Be like, hey, remind me about this at this time. Or, you know, when I get home, I need to do this. And uh, uh, so thank you, Apple, for Siri, because without, <laughs> without it, I probably would not be able to function as well as I do. So Siri helps micromanage your day. And then, you know, part of the reason I'm going into that is that Jacob is very psychic. And we like we've known each other for like four years now at this point. And like there's something people need to understand about being psychic, by the way, before I even keep going on this, is that people look at people who are psychic or work as psychics or are known to be psychic and say, but why isn't your life perfect? Don't you know? Didn't you know I was going to call? We get to know almost nothing ourselves. And it's partially because our, our, your ego will always interfere and you will see what you want to see in the cards. So there's that. And then if you believe in a spiritual component to it, and I do, there is a part of you that is going to limit what you allow yourself to know about other people because it's intrusive and invasive and it's a boundary issue. It's like being yeah. able to read other people's diaries. And whereas like right. I can do that in a professional context, these people are not very close to me. And so therefore I am able to, it, it, I have no power over the people I'm reading over. I'm just giving information that has to be sought out through a third party, in this case, me, to somebody to help them with their own path and understanding things. And we can all need help sometimes, but actual people who you can be very, very psychic and still not be making the best decisions or not know what's coming at you because we tend to be psychic for world events or other people far more easily because what we want and desire will always act as a blocking force in our own abilities. So that is that explanation because so many people who don't believe in this stuff make that joke. And it's like, well, there's a good reason. It's a self-limiting thing. It would give people like way too much power over others. But you have two forms of neurodivergence. And then you are also, you have a post-traumatic stress disorder disorder as well, which I was very intrigued to find out that within about the last five years, it has begun to be encompassed underneath that umbrella for neurodivergence. And neurodivergence mm -hmm. is when your brain quite simply processes its stimuli in a different manner. And usually you are far more sen sensitive to that stimulus. Um, what you're talking about with being able to um, not maintain focus and being distracted easily and going to do things and not being able to stay on point and on task unless you have an exterior force, either a medication or in this case, Siri, helping you stay on point is incredibly uh, common. And then another thing I know about uh, attention deficit disorder, and there's going to be over overlapping things like the different uh, people on the spectrum will have some things in common with people with ADHD and people with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, um, uh, borderline personality disorder um it can is also in that neurodivergence and i fully admit i don't have that and i don't know a great deal about it um but i did i did some research on it and there are overlapping things as well they also have hyper focus and that yeah. the focus issue oh, is the not. thing that <laughs> it's it, the focus issue is the thing that really gives people a leg up on their ability to discern because that's really what it is, is being able to, we've talked about the structure of time not being linear and everything happening at once. And honest to God, that's MIT science. That is not woo-woo science. That is not junk science. That is the developing field around understanding the structure of time science. And it is a real and a hard science or not a hard science as much as it, it has a People are very well trained looking into it. People who have a great many credentials are looking into that. And the conclusion thus far has been is that the structure of time as we know it is happening all at once. It is our consciousness and our thinking that makes us perceive it in a linear fashion. And people can talk about chronological age and please understand we're talking about a, a structure of reality that is con so currently beyond our understanding. It doesn't mean we won't ever understand it. But currently, there's just more going on with the structure of reality than we have understood up until this point. Jacob, when you were looking into neurodivergence, because you did a lot of research on this one, how prevalent did you find it to be? As far as like neurodivergency as a whole or? In, yes, within society, within society. Um, I think the numbers that you quoted are actually pretty, pretty close. Um, I didn't necessarily look and see like what the prevalence is um, across the board, um, especially since we have to, the, the first question is what qualifies for neurodivergency and what does not qualify um, from a purely clinical standpoint. Um, 
the, this episode came at a good time. So I actually had therapy yesterday. So I was able to actually ask my therapist uh, this question. He's like, you know, how would you define neurodivergency? Um, would you consider X, Y, and Z neurodivergent uh, conditions or, and what she said and what some of the things I've read, it's, it's kind of a split. Mm-hmm. People are split on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? It, yeah. Um, it's a developing um, field. And, right. Exactly. So like at base definition, you know, we can look and see, or we can understand it as um, the video too. PTSD, um, the disorder um, of extinction. Hey, Okay, everybody, we're back. Now, please keep in mind, Jacob and I do not get paid to do this. And so it's not like we have a sound editor and sometimes things go a little bit awry. But Jacob had a video launch in the background. So I very quickly stopped the recording so that we wouldn't have multiple voices. We're picking up where we left off. Jacob, you've spoken to your therapist about the neurodivergence, what is considered neurodivergence. And we were kind of covering the fact that it is not, there's not full consensus on this issue. Um, For a long time, I think neurodivergence was almost uh, exclusively applied to people on the autism spectrum scale, and it is no longer solely applied to people on the autism spectrum scale. So I'm going to turn it back to you. What did your therapist, your trained therapist, (laughs) have to say about it? Uh, So, yeah, it's the prevalent thought at the moment would be that, you know, anything that like has like like a genetic change into your how your brain functions right and it's not like necessarily considered like if you have an external uh you know s- stimulus that causes you know neurodivergent behavior maybe those two things are not equitable um but again i guess it's just depends on what your educational background is and what you kind of decide on your own uh, i've seen both sides of the coin whenever i was reading about all this so um i don't know it's it <laughs> It's hard to classify, so we'll just start there. And then um, the other thing that I blanket that I wanted to put out before we got too far into this is like um, to kind of stay away from like self diagnosis as much as possible because there are criteria that you have to to meet right in order to have a diagnosis. And some people fit like some of those things, but not everything. Um, so like if you get on TikTok and you're like, oh, here's some ADD behavior, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's that's me. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have the condition. It just means that you hit some of those markers, right? So I would like everyone to like shy away from being diagnosticians at this point, uh, when at all possible, and go talk to somebody about it if you think that you have this condition. Um, well, and, and that is an excellent point. And please to remember, remember that most things that contain the label of being a disorder are actually normal behaviors that then got out of control and begin to rule a person's personal universe. And so. A lot of people will have, you know, sometimes I have trouble focusing and it's like, I need to eat something. My blood sugar is low. That does not make you ADHD. And when we, and you're, you're very, very right about like shy away from deciding what you might have. It's good to read up on things to help you understand what may be going on with you, but that like, there's a whole field of people who are trained in this, who can help you understand it at a more professional level that when you're doing this, if you're looking into things to do, see, do I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder? Do I have post-traumatic stress disorder? It is to help you understand the feelings and the responses that you are having, but it is not definitive of everything that is going on with you. Meaning that for many years, and one of the reasons I'm super glad you brought that up was I had such a weird social experience growing up where I was just so very very isolated from pretty much everybody that I've always been very very different and so some and like big social situations used to freak me out Um, I'm actually incredibly introverted and I used to be agoraphobic and these are all things that I kind of like you know guided myself out of being able to increase my abilities through desensitization over and over again by setting the goals that and I did that myself I did not actually have professional help on that but I've always been a little bit gifted in being able to be resourceful and solve those problems for myself I've been I've always been able to figure things out. Um, But that to please, so for a while, when like uh, people on the autism spectrum scale, it became more of a social conversation, more of the general conversation. I read a list and I'm like, well, I have that being overwhelmed and overstimulated by social situations being one of them. And I have that and I have that, but like, I, I do have empathy. I am not like, I, there were things I didn't hit at all, but it always intrigued me that like three of those things I did 
And it kind of occurred to me that it was a socialization issue versus a genetic issue or the way a congenital thing. Um, it was something that had happened to me because I quite literally wasn't properly socialized because both of my parents were only children. So I had no aunts, uncles, cousins or anything. And then like, I just had very weird circumstances growing up in which I always only had one caretaker. And that person was always incredibly detached from me for some reason, leaving me by myself a ton. And it made me very different. And as I was looking into neurodivergence, because the other thing I started to wonder was how in the world did I get so psychic? Now, am I super psychic for myself? My God, my relationship history indicates that no, but I was always very psychic for big decisions in a uh, former marriage. And I've always had very good instincts about things that weren't my interpersonal relationships. And I wondered if it was the idea of having been al some alone that like essentially my receptors, I was super, super sensitive because I, until I was an adult, I did not learn how to properly kind of close down around other people so that I wasn't taking in too much information. And that's when I started to do some kind of research. You know, this is like very cursory. This is not the same thing as a scientist doing research. This was I'm looking into this because I'm interested in something that began to be revealed through my card readings which is that people who have the PTSD marker or the CPTSD marker, which is going to be the 10 of swords in reverse or more reliably the nine of wands in the upright. The nine of wands in the upright is the wounded warrior card. And that is somebody who is likely to be suffering from trauma. And I noticed that they have them in conjunction with certain other cards, which like the star is one for psychic connection. The high priestess is another one for psychic connection. And then they'd also have it with the 10 of swords in reverse, which is a deep trauma card as well. And I just started to notice that there was a relationship through a lot of the people who come to me for readings are actually professional tarot card readers. I'm a reader's reader. Sometimes it just is the way it worked out. And I started to wonder what outside of what what in their experience allowed them to more accurately access their psychic gifts because everybody is supposed to be able to have strong intuition and psychic gifts but it seems to be more easily developed in people who had a reason to have hyper vigilance become part of their thinking or it was genetically part of their thinking. And all of the things that we're talking about with neurodivergence that overlap, that's the one that seems to be universal, is hyper vigilance on things, which is being incredibly observant and sometimes in a defensive posture, but that's not universal. So Jacob, you have bipolar disorder and you have attention deficit disorder and you also have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Is that correct? Well, I see that that last one is the one that I don't think that is necessarily applicable to me after okay. everything that I, um, for me, I would have thought that at first, um, but I don't hit some of the, um, I don't hit the markers for CPTSD, which is difficult to kind of like quantify because as far as the DSM goes, which is the diagnostic manual that we use in the United States for psychiatric disorders, um, is not recognized uh, per se. It's not in the DSM-5. Um, they did expand the definition of PTSD to kind of include some of these. And there's like an unofficial like marker system to describe the complex form of PTSD. Um, but in like the European manual, they are a lot more open to this idea and they have expanded, you know, their um, definition of PTSD to kind of include CPTSD as well. Um, so as I was doing my reading and I, you know, kind of was looking at it, um, I don't hit the long-term markers for a lot of, um, to basically qualify for that CPTSD, um, diagnosis. They did a study that basically showed that wet, right after the event, they took people who had experienced a traumatic event and followed them over the course of 12 weeks and did check-ins every week over the course of three months. And what they found was in the immediate one, one to two weeks, everyone was kind of high on their, um, di like the diagnostic criteria that they had. But as time went on over the course of the 12 weeks, they discovered that about 50% of those, uh, patients, um, had a drop off in symptoms that would classify them 
uh, for diagnosis. Uh, and I just think that I am one of those 50% that kind of like tapered off. When I think about childhood abuse, when I think about um, like the time that I was held at gunpoint and was uh, pretty much <laughs> uh, was sure that I was going to die that night. Um, I hit those markers for a couple of weeks, but as time went on, my um, clinical response, as I'll put it that way, um, diminished to where I was no longer avoiding certain behaviors. Um, I did not have the daily dysfunction um, that is associated with it as well. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know that I feel like that definition kind of describes me anymore. Um, um, well, the first anymore, two, yes. like underline <laughs> anymore, underline anymore, because the thing about both PTSD and complex post-traumatic stress disorder, and really quickly, I'm going to tell people what the difference between PTSD and CPTSD might be. And please remember that PTSD is also something that entered the lexicon at a different point. We are always developing in this field as we become more sophisticated in our understanding. For complex post-traumatic stress disorder, the difference between complex and regular post-traumatic stress disorder, which you don't want either, but complex has a duration to it. It means that it was a situation that was either layered and had multiple forms of trauma happening at once, but it also went on for a long period of time. So people who had extremely abusive childhoods frequently do have CPTSD because the way that they respond emotionally and the way they handle their emotions was ingrained into them through trauma and sometimes through abusive caretakers and parents. Bullying can also cause CPTSD. PTSD and CPTSD mm -hmm. have something in common in everything that I've read about, which is that through therapy, through techniques, sometimes through medication, if there are no other resulting disorders, such as by borderline personality disorder or bipolar disorder can also, there's some theory that it is one of the results of trauma. If there are no secondary disorders, um, I have mild OCD and I have general anxiety disorder. But if you are able to begin to resolve the behaviors and the, you desensitize yourself to the things that cause these giant emotional regulation issues, which are one of the hallmarks of CPTSD, you can resolve it. So it means that it becomes something that you are not closing the door on. You will always have to engage in specific maintenance behaviors around stressors or what are called triggers, but you can resolve its impact on your life, which is what I have done. There is no question whatsoever that when I was younger, I was, I had the same, the way it was described to me by uh, the first therapist I ever saw was that I had the same form of post-traumatic stress disorder as war veterans and war victims. And that's how they used to talk about it. And now they talk about it more as being about CPTSD. And that is that complex situation where there's no escape from the trauma. But that doesn't mean it's a life sentence. It's just a part of you, a definition, some information that can then carry you forward towards finding your solutions and potentially your resolutions. And if you can resolve things like CPTSD and PTSD, you can still maintain access to that hidden Cracker Jack surprise that I'm talking about as well, which is that you become more open and receptive. If you have big everything, it's like your receptors are blown wide open. And apparently that is being open, having an open channel, having open receptors is one of the things that aids psychic ability and intuition and being able to be guided in the choices that you make towards the ones that will give you the best outcomes that can also warn you about dangerous situations. So you get to retain that part while resolving the trauma. And the reason I really wanted to hit that one on the head over and over again is if you are hesitating in getting help, for what you suspect is CPTSD or PTSD, please get help because it is not a life sentence. You may have to manage things like I'm always going to have to be very good about making sure I have enough food inside of me. I have a like I have an eating disorder as well. A lot of sexual abuse uh, survivors uh, struggle with eating disorders, and so I, it's always one of my battlegrounds. And one of my key things in maintaining my emotional and my mental health is making sure that I eat healthfully and that I don't try and push on through when I'm stressed out, when I have a lot to do, I have to stop and eat because it is part of my own 
tunnel vision, the survival mode that somatic uh, stress disorder, what, whether it's CPTSD or PTSD people have, is that they can get survival mode or tunnel vision of trying to get to a point at which they feel safe, which is often a point of completion in tasks. So again, if you suspect mm -hmm. that you have any of these disorders, do not think of it as I am broken and I am forever going to be in this external position to society, looking in through the glass. Everything is not for me. It's for the normies. You're just some treatment yeah. away from greater, greater understanding of self to have a better life. It is always worth it to go towards help. And if you can't afford it, that's part of the reason Jacob and I do this stuff. It's part of the reason a lot of other people do. There's some very well-trained professionals who also provide free materials online. People who have readings for me know that I provide all kinds of free resources afterwards and healing sounds and all kinds of stuff. So please remember, one of the beautiful things about the information technology is that we have our answers and our treatment and our ability to reach out for help in our hands in the form of our phones. So that's my little soapbox on that one. I'm gonna turn it back to Jacob over here. So you're the guy who did the research on this. And what did you find about the prognosis for meaningful recovery or management? Because what I read indicated that it's very good. It is very good. Um, I guess like, just kind of circle back a little bit. Uh, I guess my medication regimen was one of the things that kind of helped me get out of it. Right. Um, because like when you have a mood disorder, which is basically what bipolar disorder is, the dysregulation of mood can kind of, uh, um, cause these symptoms to be more, you know, longer lasting, you know, affects more of your life. Um, so I've been on medication for since my early twenties. So I guess that was a super helpful in kind of mitigating my emotional response to uh, triggers. Um, so which kind of helped me get out of this CPTSD mindset, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and then touch on your like more, when I'm off of my medications, I can definitely tell a difference in my ability to read cards and to do um, work in that, in that area. Um, I, you probably remember there was that time where I was on medicated and I just, I couldn't read for anything like for you, for other people. I had to quit reading for a while just because it was so, I was all over, the, all over the place. I couldn't get any kind of information that I want or needed. Um, so yeah, it was very difficult. Uh, so I'm just going to touch on that for a second. Um, but the, uh, the other issue right now that I read about is that a lot of patients who would qualify for a CPTSD diagnosis because they are with clinicians who maybe are not as um, educated on the subject, who maybe don't uh, follow the trend of thought about what it is and how it should be diagnosed, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes will misdiagnose with um, borderline disorder, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting. However, the good thing about that is that the treatment uh, modalities for um, borderline personality disorder or bipolar disorder are usually helpful for um, CPTSD uh, patients as well. So even though there is a misdiagnosis, the treatment plan is more or less the same. So you can still get you know, effective treatments overall, but without like that you no know, more nuanced you know understanding of what's going on uh it could be a longer process or maybe not one that's uh you know as effective you know I've, I've shared with you before maybe on the podcast about how uh cbt therapy was not super helpful for me it was right. i mean it was helpful enough. i was able to you know function and kind of mitigate some of those um you know parts of my disorder um but it just wasn't overall effective i was never going to get to that place that i needed to be under that umbrella um and so that is the issue that i would find with being misdiagnosed with um bd or you know anything like that is that you're never going to reach like the best point that you could get right you're, you're still going to be able to get some help and uh all that but you're never going to be where you know you could be um, so I hope that more clinicians will look into this and they'll kind of understand this distinction and offer, you know, more, you know, ACT, which is what I've started has been shown to be super helpful. Um, eye directional movement therapy, EDM therapy has been shown to be very, very effective for PTSD patients and CPTSD patients. Um, that's kind of my uh, treatment du jour right now that I really am uh, wanting to learn more about because it has been shown to be so effective for PTSD patients. Um so it's also something to consider. Um, 
you're basically what you're saying with the CBT is that it turned out to be a tool, but it wasn't the toolbox entire. And that is something that people need to understand is that you may need to have multiple techniques if you have something complex. And by the way, the whole thing with borderline personality disorder, um, part of the reason that it was, um, it gets lobbed against trauma survivors a great deal, usually by men who are like, hey, you have emotional regulation issues, therefore you must have borderline personality disorder. Um, no, there are very distinctive hallmarks for borderline personality disorder. And I, for one, am like, you know, at least grateful that that information has been available for a long time because I read up on it and I was like, well, I do have that and I do have that, but I don't have that, I don't have that, I don't have that, and I don't have that. And so it is important when we're talking about the perils of self-diagnosis is to remember that there is overlap in most forms of trauma that would then cause a form of neurodivergence that is outside the congenital or the, gen the genetic one, which is, again, people on the autism spectrum scale, that is considered a permanent thing, whereas there is a transient form of neurodivergence. And that's what you're talking about with clinicians being open to the idea that something can inhabit a space until such time that it has been treated effectively, and then it moves beyond that space. And you might have to keep the tools that you learned from the different techniques, because CBT has been very effective for you, and ACT has been very effective for you. And then EDM, which you referred to, is one of the things that all of my clients have come back on it saying that anybody who's gone towards it, it has made a world of difference in what is like their quality of life. And when we get right back yeah. to, down to it, that is what the entire point of going on a healing journey, which can be rough. I mean, it can at first be like, this sucks even worse as you try to confront all of the ways in which you have to not repress your emotions but handle them, understand them. It's called the responding, not reacting thing, which is what the role of ACT is about, is learning to accept the emotions that you have to not, CBT is all about correcting things, choosing the emotional direction. ACT, in, from what I've read about it, and you're gonna know more about it than I do, is really about learning to coexist with without judgment or shame, the emotional regulation regulation issues that you might have and to respond to them appropriately within the moment, knowing that this is a fluctuating structure and that the needs of one moment may not be the needs of the next moment and that that is normal and to be expected. Is that correct? For sure. Yeah, 100%. Um, um, <laughs> oh, Jacob is coughing. I was about to let him. <laughs> Are you muted, dude? Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, no, um, yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. Um, sorry, I meet myself sometimes when the dog go, goes crazy. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's you got it spot on. It's just about living in the moment with the emotion instead of like trying to, um, quote unquote, fix the emotion or get rid of it. Um, yeah, like you said, CBT is about rewiring, ACT is more about living with what you're feeling. Um, th that's why CBT didn't really work for me. I could never diminish the, the thought or the emotion um partly because i think because i'm so bad at visualization i think that's kind of like my hindrance with cbt but act has been much more effective because uh now i have the emotion and i've learned how to sit with it and let it be a passenger instead of it being the driver i guess if you want to think about it in that kind of that kind of way um, the, the biggest struggle for me was learning how to allow myself to just feel emotions like and honest goodness, I was because like, and again, like, I'm, you know, this is far in the past, but it went, but please remember that if you're a full grown person, you're like, what does my childhood matter now? It taught you how to respond to everything around you how to handle things, how to handle your interpersonal relationships, how to handle your emotions. It is not about forever defining yourself by your childhood, but to understand that that's what poured your foundation and you might need to go back and do some repairs on it so that you can have a sturdy structure in your adulthood. And that is a really important thing, is that many people who came through uniquely or you know, distinctively abusive situations, one of the worst thoughts in the world is to go back and do any, it's like, please, I barely survived that. I don't want to go back and look at it. It's not the same thing as psychoanalysis. 
It is understanding that the circumstances that surrounded you informed your development in a way that you may have to adjust to and incorporate new techniques into quite simply so that you can have a healthy and a balanced life. And the other thing to remember is that we're, when we talked very at the very top of this, the 5 to 20%, that is a giant range. That is a like, wait, what range of what do you mean 5 to 20%? Because Five is one thing, and then 20% is a full 15% more. And so that would mean that one in five people, if 20% is true, have some form of trauma disorder or some form of neurodivergence. And that means it's common. So quit thinking of yourself as broken. You have something in common with people who were damaged and just need to hammer out their dents with the tools that you can acquire through various techniques and various therapies. And that it is important yep. to get another point of view into it. Now I help people all the time. Um, I really have a lot of therapists for clients, um, but it is very important to talk to people who are well-trained and remember you will not click with absolutely every medical and mental health professional out there. And if you do feel in any way judged, shamed, or criticized by a therapist or any other professional, get thee to another one. They are all just people as well. Never be afraid to shop around for mental health uh, providers. Uh, I did it. Uh, most people that I know that are in therapy do it as well. Um, it's important to connect with your therapist. You need to feel like it's an open space. Um, I've told my therapist things that probably... I tell her everything basically because you need to feel that non-judgment um, because all, all parts of your your yourself are important in this healing journey. And if they don't know the information, they can't give you the proper tools to um, you know handle what's going on. Um, for my own part, since like I don't have a therapist and haven't in a very long time, um, the way that I healed a great many things and starting to understand my emotions and what caused them and what built like, for, for instance, large fear responses or anxiety responses or even anger responses was that I learned how to talk to myself quite literally. And I tell my clients this a lot is speak into voice memo and play it back to yourself because a big part of, because if you can't, not everybody has medical insurance, not everybody can afford a therapist. What do you do if you're broke and you're still dealing with these things? Because unfortunately, trauma often leads to generational poverty. And so what do you do if, and please remember, this is not medical advice and for legal reasons, honest to goodness, please get something, get advice from people who are actually trained, like they, they know what they're talking about. This is what has worked for me and I'm simply say, uh, sharing it, which is that I learned to start addressing how I was feeling by learning how to express my feelings. I had been married to somebody who would punish me very badly. In and I don't mean physically. He was just a very emotionally abusive person. Um, if I showed anything other than a happy face all the time, which meant I was always repressing everything else. And so I was only allowed to have this one very pleasant emotion around this person. But that's not normal. It's not normal. It's not yeah. And so I was stuffing it down. And by the way, that's, that's just one of the hallmarks of that type of relationship. It's the red flag in a relationship. Um, is, so I had learned to stuff them down so much for so long that I no longer really had access to them and learning how to talk aloud about them, even though it felt awkward because I was by myself talking into voice memo and listening to it back to get me acquainted with my own emotional thought process. And it worked like a charm for me. And it really is the thing that took me out of being a, in a very fragile state after that marriage into being into a really robustly healthy state and able to help other people with it. And let's circle back to the idea of what role that plays in your ability to be psychic, to also manifest, to have more control over your what comes in and what you do with it. Because you're at the whim of input when you are still injured, when you're still traumatized, when you have not started to assemble the toolkit like you have done through the various forms of therapy and medication. I don't personally take medication, but I would if I had to. It's just that I really, really wanted to learn how to manage everything through diet and exercise. Um, because I'm able to, because I'm, for everything that I possess, every disorder that I possess, I don't, if things are graded on a one to 10, I have it at a one to two on all of them. I'm very, very, very fortunate. And I'm not entirely sure why. I'm just very fortunate. And if you're not, know that there's a lot of help available. But the thing about when you are no longer 
at the whim of the input. Instead, when you have input, when something is coming towards you that is causing stress or might normally frustrate you or might normally trigger you, and instead you know what to do and how to handle it, and you can recognize your own, the red flags we throw off within ourselves of going, I'm going to be triggered around this. That could upset me. That looks like a really frustrating day. I better plan to eat really heartily. That is always me. If I'm really, really, really strongly scheduled, I have to be like, okay, what am I eating? Uh, what time do I need to eat it? How heavy does it need to be to get me through the rest of that? Because for me, my blood sugar going up and down can cause a lot of emotional regulation stuff. But that is just something that I learned that now makes my life far more comfortable. And when you learn those things, then you're able to maintain that you still are highly sensitive. And there is actually, the, it's called being an HSP, highly sensitive person. That's another developing field where they have begun to recognize it's like, no, some people genuinely are incredibly sensitive. Now, I come under some of the umbrella of that as well, obviously caused through so much isolation growing up. And then I maintained it a great deal as an adult. And it's just my preferred state. I really like to spend a lot of time by myself. I did it as a kid and I know how to keep myself entertained and be good company for myself. When you have the tools, then you have the gift without the dents and the damage that keep you from accessing it in a productive and a meaningful and a healing way. So there are so many reasons to go towards this. And is everybody who has one of those trauma disorders uh, highly intuitive or highly psychic? Not to the best of my knowledge, but there exists the possibility that it is there waiting to be developed when the disruption of negative input leading to your own negative output has been resolved through technique or treatment or medication. So it's sure, very yeah. much worth the idea. Jacob. Yeah, I agree. And uh, something that we've talked about before is I think what is also helpful is the when you have a disorder like I do, the need for structure and the need for constant grounding is very important. Mm -hmm. And most people, uh, one thing, well, let me rephrase that. I can't speak to that, but um, something that is helpful for me that I don't do enough is like meditation, um, certain grounding practices that I could be better at. And so whenever you're forced to engage in those kinds of behaviors to control your, your like mood dysregulation in my case, um, it allows you to be more open to the, what I would call universal consciousness, um, mm -hmm. which allows you to be more tapped into this intuition and this like ability to connect with other people in a way that is, you know, more ethereal or more, you know, something. More it contains more details. It's more likely to have the piece that you need to know. The role of grounding and in intuition yeah. is that there are infinite possibilities out there. If you're anchored at this point in time in your consciousness, then you are far more likely to be able to sort through the stuff that is like, no, that's not it. That's not it. And your mind brings you the thing that is actually within essentially the timeline that you are moving. So there are always ungrounded realities. And that's why being grounded is so very important. And really quickly, because we, we throw out these terms all the time and people don't really cover well what does that mean and how do you do it being grounded is essentially being anchored in the here and the now in the present moment which is part of mindfulness and one of the things that you can do for grounding is as i was just covering it's things that kind of bring you into your physical body into your here and your now you can practice awareness where you start assessing your actual physical thing to see the details around it that's a grounding practice exercise works a great deal for me. Um, actually, some people love to just get out and touch the ground, walk on the earth. I do that too. I touch trees. It's, it is something that is one of the things that pulls you into the present moment is what a grounding practice is. So it can be showers, it can be exercise, it can be eating, it can be what you need it to be. It can be what you need it to be. You can listen to balancing recordings. We, we, respond, we respond to frequencies and to vibrations. It sets our mood very easily. And of course, the example that I always use for that, the ones that people are like, what are you talking about? This is the easiest way to understand it. Have you ever been in a shop or a store that had a buzzing fluorescent light overhead? Every drugstore in America has had one of those at one time. And it's the worst sound and people get headaches from it. And the second you're away from it, you're like, oh, thank the sweet lords of mercy that's out of my life. It has an impact on how you feel, 
on your emotional response system, on everything about you. Now, if you use positive sounds as well, then the like the um, the opposite can be true. You can manage your energy into giving you the best possible. It's called inhabiting frequency inhabiting the best possible frequency through these practices. And again, grounding all these very woo-woo things, which, you know, everybody knows I've got one foot in the woo-woo and one foot on the here and the now, because I'm an earth sign, we're very grounded folks. Um, one of the things to remember is that it's not all woo-woo to be able to do these things. At working out mm -hmm. is a grounding process. Cleaning your home is a grounding process. Walking your dogs is a way of being grounded. For some people, reaching out to another person to be in the here and the now. And why is grounding so like associated with like helping to alleviate the symptoms of trauma disorders? Because trauma disorders frequently involve something called dissociation, and it comes in different forms and at different degrees. And dissociation is essentially when your mind goes into another part of itself, another consciousness, in order to seek safety when you're overwhelmed, and it almost feels like you're having an out-of-body experience. And it's the weird thing about dissociative disorders that, again, can be managed into order is that it then allows you to have this access to essentially your higher self. And that is not science. That is observational. That is something that I've put together over the time that I've been reading for people and studying about this. But it seems to hold true, yeah. and it might hold true for you as well. Jacob, what do you find really helps you for grounding? Um, well, to be fair, like what you're talking about has been studied in some degree, and there is scientific literature that does support this idea of what you're talking about. Um, so while you're coming from an anecdotal place, there is research that you know does support <laughs> what you're saying. So that's that's a positive. Um, you know, I'm terribly bad at grounding. Um, uh, for me, I go the pretty um, literal route i like to spend time outside um the dog getting a dog was super helpful in that um for that because it forces me to go outside multiple times a day so that's really nice uh i've been as much i used to think it was it was silly but i have become that person who goes outside barefoot and just like stands in the grass um uh go far as to like hanging out in with trees but like you know even something as simple as like taking a book outside sitting under a tree with your back against the tree you know you're focused on this book and like i don't know i do things like that uh i like to be outside so i just kind of incorporate that into it um especially when i'm unmedicated like right now tasks like cleaning my house which can be very grounding and helpful i just can't i can't focus on things like that but if i have something like going on a walk um, or like uh, the other part, like I, I talked about like the dysfunction and like being able to, you know, stay focused, but you brought up earlier, the other part of that is hyper fixation is a really big part of my journey as well. Um, and so having something to anchor, like going outside and reading, um, that gives me the anchor that I need to stay in this like grounded practice and state. Um, so sometimes, if, you know, if you're out there and you have trouble like I do, find something that you can hyper fixate on. Go outside with like some knitting or you know, like something that you can keep your hands busy or your mind focused on. And that's super helpful as well. Um, I guess it's almost kind of like a, a meditative practice as well to kind of do stuff like that. But um, that's what helps me the most is find a hyper fixation and then find, use that to assist your grounding as well. One of the things that I found that helps in grounding as a grounding practice is when I am feeling like I'm super anxious or I'm angry or what, I then invite something into my life that will trigger it at a very, very mild level. Like I talked about using the Mind Games app for, and it causes like anxiety, a test anxiety when you're doing these Mind Games exercises. And they're not so challenging that you could ever feel like a failure. But I did start noticing it's like this helps a lot because it offers an expression or an alleviation of that anxious energy in a, in a in an atmosphere where I know there are no stakes. Like there's no, there's like no goal. I'm going to pop out of the freaking iPad and be like, you are penalized. We're going to send you back a grade. Like there's no stakes. So I can have this anxious response 
pour out that energy on something where it's like, oh no, math, not my strong point. So I'll do all of these math tests in the mind game app to invite a level of anxiety that I am then managing and keeping within control. And that is one of the ways that alleviates the energy that then allows me to move on from the distracting emotion. And the same thing can hold true with fear. I can watch something frightening. And again, you know you're safe but it kind of expresses that um, energy. And then for frustration, a lot of people find that engaging in a creative pursuit is one of the best things that you can do. Um, it's, it's also a form that helps you get in touch with your ability to be magical. If you are creating something, you are reaching for the energy that is about magic expression as well. Um, I'm going to share something about the whole, because when you said you're not so woo-woo that you go hang out with trees, and of course I am, and I like I hardly ever think of myself as being super woo-woo, but there is a specific reason, because I have always wondered what attached me to, like anybody who's ever had a reading with me, it is very clear that something is telling me things sometimes, and it's not the same thing as being schizophrenic. I, how would... If I was schizophrenic, I would not be able to look in somebody's cards and tell them something about them, which is what happens over and over again. But it is something that is almost, uh, it's channeling. It's a form of channeling where the answers come from an exterior source. And I've always wondered what caused that. If it wasn't part of trauma, it's like, well, how'd that happen to me? And I was talking to a fellow practitioner about the Quaker farm camp thing that uh, I've talked about before, which I started going at the age of seven and went through the age of 12, which was the, the limit on when we were allowed. And my grandmother would save up like a miser to send me there to get away from me, which I don't blame her at all. Like it's hard to be stuck with, you know, your grandchild when you're a miserable alcoholic. Um, but I loved it. And one of the things that they always did is that Quakers do not have a church service. They have something called a meeting. And nobody speaks unless they feel moved. And because it was a Quaker farm camp, they would have meeting in the woods. And every single magic practitioner is going to go, oh, when I tell you the rest of this, they would light a fire, sit around, mm -hmm. everybody would intently and silently focus <laughs> on the idea of like God or the divine or being inspired by something. And then they, we would cook food in that fire and eat it. And like every single magic practitioner goes, that's a conjuring ritual. It's like, yeah, I know. It's and it turned, in the woods. Yeah, exactly. So basically, I apparently, my best theory on this is why in the world did I get this was apparently at the age of seven, I began to conjure the advanced spirit of communication or the spirit of air, which is uniquely represented by trees. That mm. is why channelers are always they do so well around trees because trees are actually bizarrely enough connected to the earth, but comprised of air. What constitutes them? I read a scientific study on it. I'm not going to remember the name of it about three months ago and was just astounded that they are comprised of air. So that has been what like neuro, and it's a very far reaching episode that I hope you were able to follow. Mostly I'm trying to get people to understand if you're trying to heal something, Remember, one of the things that might be on the other side of it is having greater access to a greater sensitivity that's within your control that can then inform your outcomes and aid your life and aid your relationships and aid your purposeful path and make you feel a resonant joy in being alive. Because when you are on a purposeful path, and it's please don't confuse the word purpose and profession, too many people do that. When you know that there is a reason for you to do the things that you do, that you are contributing something, that you are meant to be here, that you are connected to all, it's much easier to let things pass that are difficult. It is much easier mm -hmm. to see the fabric of your life as weaving a particular tapestry rather than kicking you around the block because something has it in for you. Everything that I talk about with my difficult past, it informs everything that I do now in helping other people. Does that mean it happened to me because of that? I genuinely don't know. But if it did, it's because I volunteered for it. But it serves a purpose in helping free other people from emotional pain, which is it's as significant as physical pain, but our society and our world has only recently learned to treat it as such. Please remember there are multiple healing modalities and many ways to connect to a healing energy that will take away your pain but leave behind your gifts.
This has been Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Thank you so much for joining us. My friend Jacob Fluharty, available at Southern Style Readings on Facebook. He is a great reader. He reads for me. Um, and hardly anybody can. Like, you have to be a really strong psychic to read for me. Um, why? Because I'm really, really stubborn and I apparently my guides are like Marines or something. Um, and then he's also available at Southern Style Readings at gmail.com. You can find me at, at therisingmoon.com to book a tarot card reading or a life coaching session. Only way to book me. I always have to say that because we've all got scam artists out there impersonating us. Um, and then Chromecast at the Rising Moon on YouTube and then Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Heal your stuff, uncover your gifts, and be able to discover your path. Take care. Be well.